Well, this is awkward. In an interview with the New York Times, a paper, Dana, oh. Jimmy Carter says the media has been more brutal on Donald Trump than any president in recent memory. Carter is 93, so that covers a lot of ground. But don't take his word for it. Harvard, no fan of Trump either, analyzed news coverage of his first 100 days and found that the president received unsparing coverage without a single topic where coverage was more good than bad. But you got to give Jimmy credit for saying what will tick off the strident hordes in his party and media. Carter nails the loudest critics for questioning Trump's sanity, which will, and will no doubt cause them to question Carter's sanity too. But the side benefit of being an old fogey, you don't care. You can say what you want, which usually means the truth. At 93, it's not like you need any more friends or a job recommendation or an invitation to Brian Stelter's book party. If it upsets the crybaby news network, that's life. Huh. The point Carter's making, that whether you like Trump or not, it's impossible for one man to be everything his haters say he is. Instead, it reflects the irrational emotion on their side, not actual facts or deeds. Even Carter admits Trump's actions may lead to progress on immigration, and he even offered to help him with North Korea. So JC is saying not what his pals want to hear, but what America should hear. That Trump may not have been your choice for president, but he's your president. Talk about a reasonable Democrat. He may be the last one left. <laughs> All right, Juan. It's hard to argue with a progressive icon. You must be crushed. <laughs> crushed, I tell you. You uh, might not even want to comment at this point. You know, I'm, I'm tempted. I'm tempted because... Give him the temptation, Juan. Give him the temptation, says Jesse. Uh, you know, but I, I think this is really about Jimmy Carter seducing Donald Trump. Oh. Uh, I think that Donald Trump is a guy who needs friends, and Jimmy Carter's a guy who needs a legacy. Ooh. Because I think there's one guy here who, first of all, let me just say, can you, audience, believe that Greg Gutfeld just gave a monologue praising Jimmy Carter. First time ever. All right. So yes. that's the point, I think. I think the point is that Jimmy Carter sees himself going back to North Korea because yeah, that's, that's where he went in 94, I think, when the, yeah. that nuke deal got negotiated under President Clinton. And, of course, that nuke deal didn't hold. But he feels that he can go back in. He can play a role here in which the entire world, I think he might get a Nobel Peace Prize mm -hmm. if he was able to calm down that guy. Yeah. You know, and Jesse, you know what else he said? No Russian collusion. Yes, yeah, so we have to believe everything <laughs> Carter says now. It's the first time Carter and I agree on anything. And we have to believe Harvard, well, we too. Said Obama was a failure. Did he? Yeah. Basically, in the oh, piece, wow. that, in the right down piece. Keep talking, Carter. <laughs> and you're welcome on oh, Waters World for Hillary any Clinton. time now. Um, and Harvard said in the first 100 days, worst coverage ever, historically, and it was 80% negative if it wasn't for Fox News. It would have been even higher at 90. Mm -hmm. We were the only ones that had a 50-50. Media Research Center said this summer, the president got savaged. 91% negative coverage by the network nightly newscasts. And it's not just the tilt or the slant. It's the commentary. They've called the president of the United States a white supremacist, a bigot, a sexual assaulter, a homophobe. You name it, they can say it. And on the policy front, I can see, you know, you had a tough summer with Charlotte or the failure of Obamacare appeal. That negative coverage is fair. But let's say tax cuts get passed. That's a historic achievement for a Republican president. Will the press cover that favorably? No. Like they would maybe if Obamacare was passed by President Obama, Democratic Congress? Of course not. And that's where the bias lies. So I think at this point, the assumption when the president does anything Mm. is he's either evil, dumb, or he's lying. Yeah, it's hard and to be. And that's the truth. You mm. can't be all three, Kimberly. <laughs> Some people try. I'm they two try. out of three. <laughs> I'll figure out which one. Fun for you. So this was basically an audition. You know, it was. It was like, uh, I want to go, like, speed dating, but for job search. <laughs> He's like, put me in, coach, North Korea. And so, Juan, I concur How with nice. your statement. Thank you. And you concur with, with Greg you. and with me yes. and with Jesse. And now. No, no, not Jesse, but with you two. Okay. <laughs> I, I like it when you're selective. And <laughs> Madame Perino? I'm in. But I also think it told us something else about how, how um, the Democratic Party has moved so far left from yes. Jimmy Carter because he did say so um, that NFL players should stand. He's like, well, he's just going to go ahead and say it. So, like, Jesse's thinking, wait, this is my kind of Democrat. Farther left than Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. Carter. Where are we, Democrats? He's a Waters World guy now. That's oh right. Do you, um, do you believe he's going to get a role in, the, in this administration? No. 
No. I don't. And I, I, well, if, if President Trump could find a way for him to be constructive, I mean, perhaps, but I think it is beyond sending Jimmy Carter to try to work out some sort of diplomatic deal at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. basically. No Dennis Rodman. We did just today, <laughs> the Pentagon <laughs> is saying that we're readying the possibility of B-52 bombers to be ready to go. I think, I think that, like, the 1994 great effort a for effort it didn't work i think right. that we I think that things have moved on so much farther than that you know a lot of the uh media uh attacks on trump they blame it on the fact that he like he tweets and stuff but he has a response to that he says that if it wasn't for social media you know he would have no platform i guess go I doubt I'd be here if it weren't for social media, to be honest with you, because uh, there is a fake media out there. I get treated very unfairly by the media, and I have a tremendous platform. When somebody says something about me, I'm able to go bing, 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 and I take care of it. You know, Kimberly, a perfect example of this was last week with the um, Uranian story, sure. which was, like, floating away, but the media was forced to cover it because he mm -hmm. tweeted about it. Of course, they just cover his tweets, but it's still Right, something. but he has to actually interject it. If he doesn't tweet, they're not going to cover it, so he's part of that whole process, as he says, of keeping the press honest, because otherwise they're not going to give him a fair shake as to the list of his accomplishments. And the problem is, it's because it doesn't fit their narrative. You know, it's like trying on the prom dress, like, whoa, this is the wrong size. Too it doesn't short. fit. Yeah, exactly. I never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have extra Too smalls? Tight? <laughs> Uh, oh my God. But it does lend itself to a volatile relationship, Juan. But it's it's you know it's something that maybe this is the new normal, as I like to coin. Mm. Did you yes. ban that? Did you yes. ban that? Yes, oh. I did. Oh. But you know what was interesting to me in all this is that when we think about President Trump, and I think that it contrary to you, I think that in fact he's having a very difficult time as president of the United States, and I think he's divided the country, and I think his poll numbers suggest that. But what was striking to me, and this is what I wanted to say to Jesse, is I read this material, and it said that Trump's coverage has been pretty negative, um, but it also said almost half the time all news coverage in the country is about one man, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And secondly, most of the voices who are commenting on Donald Trump are not wacky lefties me. Right. No, they're conservative. They're Republicans. Well, I'm glad you called problems. yourself a wacky leftist. Well, I just was, that just was for your there. sake. That was but for you. But this is actually a no, good but, point. Well, that's because people on the networks will book right. conservative haters of Donald but Trump. But they're Republicans. So they're yes. fellow Republicans Republicans who have trouble for with those network shows on Sunday where they don't have a lot of respect from the grassroots, and they've always disliked Trump from the primary. That's why they get a lot of press coverage, because they're the first ones to criticize the president. Oh, so you think it's Republicans? I think networks book people they want to hear from, and it happens oh. to be people that hate well. Trump. It's kind of like, you know, when a network will find a Democrat that agrees with you. <laughs> Juan? Never heard that before. Are you available for yeah, the really. same yeah, initial? Can you agree a little more, too? That's what I say about Juan. If I'm ever out and about and people complain about Juan, I'm like, wait, this guy, is, he's like pro-education reform. He likes capitalism. Yeah. He believes in personal responsibility. I mean, you, you could do worse. You know, he um, loves, oh, what a compliment. Food court, <laughs> likes education, great writer. There you go. You're so kind. Historian. Yeah. All right, I'm getting sick now. You know, the, uh, this, this <laughs> article <laughs> from the Wall Street Journal mm, this really? morning landed on my desk. Landed on my desk, i.e. a producer came over and said, you so better talk morning. about this. But anyway, uh, it's Scott Adams. Wrote a piece for the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal called The Power of the Presidential Tweet. Mm -hmm. And the argument behind this, I think, is that he's using humor. And humor is a very important part of persuas persuasion. And things that are funny are easier to remember. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, and I totally agree with that. But I go back to that, like, some of the things that other people thought were very funny, I just personally didn't think were funny. That's right. okay. I like corny jokes. Nicknames like against name people. Calling. Like I, yeah. I, I, I didn't think it was funny. I didn't like it. It made. I, I but I, I heard it. I saw people cracking up. They loved it. And actually, when he called Kim Jong Un Rocket Man, I, was, I thought that was funny. Yeah, so a little Rocket Man. And then little. Well, that he added little. Yeah, little. Jesse loves those. I do. Names, for example. Scott Adams calls Lions those. Lions head. Kind of, kind he calls them linguistic humor. kill shots. <laughs> I think that's such a great phrase. Linguistic kill shots yeah. because when you, when you, uh, when you label somebody with that, it's hard to unlabel them. So when you say crooked Hillary, it's like it, it took over almost as, as a uh, persona, a persona for the campaign. Right. And, and it's also like Jimmy Kimmel, maybe he should have tried to be funnier when he was making his points about 
mm -hmm. um, the Obamacare changes. He's yeah. no John Stewart. He we needs a nickname, I guess, at this point. Little Kimmel. <laughs> 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 no, we like Jimmy. In case I ever have to sell a book, I do want to go on the show. I don't think, I I don't think nice he's to ever going to have Kimmel. you on. I want to be nice no matter to how many books. Roger Goodell to go to Super Bowl parties. I mean, I'm a realist. Kimmel. Shameless. You know, I think if actually, you know, I was thinking about what Scott Adams said, and I agree about humor. I think it's extremely effective as a tool of persuasion. And in Donald Trump's case, I think if there is one area where I would say Donald Trump is a genius, mm -hmm. it is at this naming of people. Right. But it's not a nice thing. I don't, it's not saying, I think it's almost like schoolyard bullying. It, it, and it can be diminishing. I mean, it's like, oh, you know, you're the short guy. You're the tall guy. You're, in fact, I think that's Little what Little Marco. Yeah. Remember? I mean, and Low so energy Jeb was yeah. devastating. Yes, yes, but it's devastating because of what Greg you was saying. You can't remove it. It sticks. You can't remove it. It sticks. Hillary. Yeah, but I don't know that I would say, oh, yes, to any young person. That's a good thing to do. Boy, what a talent to I have. I like when he goes sad. Everybody loves sad. that. Sad. But. Also, he has, uh, every once in a while, he, it's not just on Twitter where he's funny. He has these little asides. So even if he's doing a teleprompter speech, there are points where he'll, be, he'll like, repeat something. like, oh, that's really bad. And it's funny. You know what? Before you go, I just want to say what struck me about Jimmy Carter's thing also was the negative relationship he's had with Barack Obama. Right. Mrs. Carter said Michelle Obama did not invite her to a meeting of presidential wives on mental health. And she has been in the forefront of mental health efforts across this country. What a diss. And I thought, wow, that was kind what of a What a wow. diss. Yeah. You don't you, think so? You just yeah. don't know how relationships work out, even among allies. Yeah, somebody you know? asked him and said, hey, do you have President Obama's email? Mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter's, no. Well, President Obama was famous for not calling any of the other former presidents for any advice when he was in office. He I didn't know need it. He would call Jarrett. <laughs> and uh, Clinton would call, and then Obama thought he had it all figured out. All right. All right. You know, you know what? You had sweet vows. I figured out that we have to go to a break. <laughs> That's called. It's a nice, smooth little transition there. That's I learned about broadcast really television. Good. Really Where's good. your friend? Where? Oh, what do you mean? Go. Okay. <laughs> Frederick, uh, <laughs> Congresswoman Frederica Wilson demands an apology from General John Kelly after calling him a puppet and labeling herself a rock star. Coming up. <laughs> All right, Democratic Congresswoman Frederica Wilson continues to politicize the deaths of fallen service members and still lashing out a chief of staff and gold star father, John Kelly. John Kelly um, is almost, I guess you could say he, he was a puppet of the president. And what he was trying to do was divert the attention away from the president onto me. And he basically just lied on me. Not only does he owe me an apology, but he owes an apology to the American people because when he lied on me, he lied to them. And I don't think that's fair, and I, I think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. In a new tweet, the president calls her wacky and the gift that keeps on giving for the Republican Party because she's a, quote, disaster for Dems. Jesse, nice hat. Thank you. Yeah, well, is that, is that your assessment of the uh, congresswoman's attire? Nice I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, do I like the sequins? I'll let you know at the end of the show. I don't want to attack a grieving widow. She can mm -hmm. grieve however she wants to. She's pregnant. She just lost her husband. Um, I do know that this episode is not bringing any closure mm -hmm. to her, I can imagine. Um, it's not bringing any closure to the memory of Sergeant Johnson. And I think what's happened now... I can only imagine she has network TV people calling her all the time now, and I don't know where she's getting advice from, but the president now, does he want to make more calls to widows? I would think now, anytime he makes a call, is this going to be recorded? Is someone going to be snooping? Is it going to be exploited for political purposes? Well, there'll be witnesses. That's for sure. Exactly. John Kelly's obviously uh, felt a lot of pain throughout this episode. I know everybody's grieving. I know the media has been acting like vultures throughout this. I'm sure they've been banging on her door. You know, they, they not always want to interview the family members. I didn't see a lot of Benghazi family members on ABC News, never saw Kate Steinle's family on ABC, never saw Border Agent Ramos on ABC News. So they're very selective with who they use. I just think Congressman Wilson, what was the purpose mm -hmm. of going public with this condolence call? Right. Was it to make herself into a rock star? Was it to hurt Donald Trump? And I, I found some video, and maybe we can play it tomorrow, of the same Congresswoman saying on the floor, that uh, the, these FBI agents who were gunned down in a very fierce battle 
knew they were going to put their lives on the line and still did it, and she had trouble pronouncing the name of one of the FBI agents. So, you know, for her to go around and turn around and say that Donald Trump did the same thing, I think is completely unfair. Mm -hmm. I wish she also tweeted that for today. Yeah, show. we can pull it. I didn't want to pull it during your segment because I know <laughs> how Kimberly rolls, but um, I'm very afraid of her. But she also <laughs> tweeted something also very uh, discouraging. She said, Niger is President Donald Trump's Benghazi. He needs to own it. I thought Benghazi but was been part of the liberal nothing. talking post a tragedy that was thing. being yeah. exploited as a yeah. conspiracy <laughs> to hurt Hillary and Obama. Okay, so she just needs to get her story straight before she. Well, I think shooting. there's a. I have such a strongly different view on this one from you, but I would start with this, Jesse. First and foremost, Niger? well, Niger is. <laughs> let me just say, you're right about this, Kimberly. It's a serious topic right now in Washington. Yeah. People don't know what happened in Niger. And a lot of people are thinking, what, did, were we there? Remember last week you, you asked, I think, Jennifer Griffin. A lot of people don't know we're there. Why are we there? What's going on? How long have we been there? Yes. And there are questions about what happened to David Johnson's body. Yes. Why was it left there, et cetera? All of these questions. So that's an ongoing issue. That's a real news story. I want to find those answers, too. Okay, fine. So the second thing to say, though, and this is about Frederica Wilson, the congresswoman from Florida, Donald Trump, chief of staff Kelly, is that Kelly was wrong on two scores. First of all, clearly the president did say that your husband knew what he was getting into, and it did cause the widow and the mother to get upset and cry. That's just not good. And then secondly, here comes Kelly calling Frederica Wilson an empty barrel and saying that she took credit for something that she didn't do, which was to raise funding for a new FBI headquarters in Miramar, Florida. Turns out there's a video, and the video shows that she did no such thing. Well, I saw the transcript of yeah. what she said, and she was tooting her own horn. I Very don't care about so. that, but it Very wasn't what so. Kelly said. And so Kelly comes across as having become an enabler for Trump and just covering for him. Well, I think I he spoke up, he spoke all, up out of moral authority and because he was privy to it and recipients of the conversation and also has every right to participate in the conversation, not only as chief of staff, but as a gold star parent. That's you know? a good point. But so does she, the congresswoman, because she was in the car with a grieving family and they played on the speaker. I do think that there is, was another way for the congressman to express the congresswoman to express this. And that would have been to privately call the White House and ask to speak to General Kelly and tell him, I just want to let you know mm -hmm. the widow was upset when the president said this. And I think it would be good for you to tell the president that so that in the future he has more information because he's going to have to make more of these calls and it's an, it, those are important phone calls to grieving people. That, that is, we wouldn't be talking about any of this right. if, if there had been some judgment on her not to decide to go public immediately. If that call was not returned or not taken, then maybe you go decide to go to the public, but there's right. another way to do it. Plus, remember that these children are going to grow up and be able to read all of this. Yep. Yes. Okay? So, like, let's just stop it. Oh, I love when you do that. Okay. <laughs> I don't really want to talk about this. I feel next like we're a new twist. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'm no, I'm good. I'm kidding. No, actually, I am good. I'm tired of picking at this scab. You know, uh, we should, as a show, we can't because our producers pick these stories. But we should resist the inclination to pick a side all the time. And yeah. because when you weigh down one side with an opinion, then the other side needs to create an opposite weight. So that, like, if I say this and I go this, and then Juan will say this, and then I will say this, or then Jesse, and then Juan. And it, this thing just never ends, even though we hate doing it, because we actually do hate doing this. We don't like this story. It's, it's, no, one, no one is coming out of this looking very good, and it's sad that we're having this conversation. And believe me, there are other okay. stories out there, a lot of other stories out there that we could do. But anyway, I also think that Jesse made a really good point about this idea of Trump's Benghazi. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it was an ambush versus a terror attack, and we're not blaming the ambush on a movie. We're blaming we it on video, ISIS. Right? But this is the first time, that, Jesse, as Jesse points out, that they're actually admitting Benghazi exists oh, yeah. and that it actually matters. But, they, it, but it reveals that they're seeing Niger as a shameless political albatross to hang around Trump's neck mm -hmm. rather than trying to figure out what happened to four slain heroes. With Benghazi, it was a terror attack that was blamed mm -hmm. on a video. Yep. All right. Thank you for that. Next, a new twist in the Russia collusion probe. Robert Mueller now reportedly looking into a family member of one of Hillary Clinton's top aides. Coming up. Stay with us.
counsel Robert Mueller isn't just looking into the Trump campaign's ties to Russia. Guess what? He's now reportedly investigating the brother of Hillary Clinton's former campaign chair, John Podesta. Tony Podesta and his Democratic lobbying firm are now in the crosshairs following an inquiry into the finances of former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort. There's a federal criminal inquiry now into whether Podesta's firm violated the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Meanwhile, the president just addressed whether he's been advised to meet with Mueller himself in the Russian probe. I don't know. I mean, I, nobody's asked me to do that. Uh, there, has, there is no collusion, I can tell you that. Uh, everybody's seen that. You know, you have Senate meetings, you have Senate hearings, uh, and uh, nobody has asked us to do interviews anywhere. They have found no collusion. In yeah. fact, the other side even admits it. They come out of these hearings, whether it's Senate or whether it's uh, the House, and they say, is there collusion? Everyone looks at, like there's no collusion. So, Kimberly, yeah. the firm, the Podesta Group, is being looked at because Paul Manafort is accused of not registering under this act. Okay, yeah. So it seemed like this is a problem in Washington. Foreign the Podesta Group was also getting paid by a Kremlin-backed group mm -hmm. of Ukrainian fighters, and they also just happen to not actually register under this act. So Whoops. now they're saying they, they're trying to register, make sure they're fully compliant, but now they're muddied into these waters too. Well, right, and so you can't treat them differently. That's hypocritical. It's a double standard, and the time frame is 2012 to 2014, and there's some crossover there. So, okay, let's you know, do a full Russia collusion uh, you know, investigation there. I mean, is that, if that's what you want to do, let's just take a look at all of it, because they're both trying to go back to fully comply and register properly to comport with the law and that act to try and clean it up. But obviously, they're also looking at Manafort with something else. He might have some other information to be able to give them. He may have some other financial misdealings that they're trying to hook him on. But the whole headline, you know, towards the, the end of the year, year and, and Trump and collusion and everyone that was working with him, just really awful. You know, if you go back and look at what was uh, said and the damage done and the things that were printed that were outright uh, lies. Juan, do you think this looks bad for the people that are close to the Clintons? No, I mean, I think this story gets distorted because this does not involve uh, John Podesta, who was the Clinton campaign chair. It's his brother. So he's not under any investigation. It's, it's their firm. It's all about John. No, it's John's firm. John Podesta owns the... Or Tony runs, Podesta. Uh, Tony runs the uh, Podesta Group. Right. And he's one of six firms that Paul Manafort brought in to help with this Ukrainian front for the Russian Amazing. government. Right. And then he didn't register under this act that you were talking about, Dana, but then subsequently or retroactively tried to register, which is legal. But nonetheless, I think has caught the attention of Bob Mueller because what was going on there uh, would seem to be that the U.S. U.S. lobbyists were not only making a ton of money. I mean, this was big money. That's why you had six people feeding at the trough. Uh, but this is an, an, another example of how Russia gets involved in American government. And the Hill newspaper also, uh, Greg, today said that the Russians were trying to find a way to mess with Hillary Clinton all the way back in 2009. But that's when she was, you know, hitting the reset button. Yeah, they're gremlins. The <laughs> Russians, they're like little gremlins, gremlins <laughs> from the Kremlins. I'm all for finding out about the collusion stuff because I would want to know. But we also, I think we were coming down that road that it was just basically Russians being Russians. This is a hotel flashlight, you know, that exposes the blemishes of bias in the media. If the media, in the media landscape, if you salivate over collusion, but you dismiss these stories, that's the exposure. That's what this story you mean like shows. like a black light. A black light. It, yeah. shows the, it shows the bias. And the same thing goes with the uranium story, is if you don't care about the uranium story, but you still are, you know, crazed over, um, over collusion, that's your bias. The problem with this story not as juicy because two sentences in, it's a little kind of tedious. The lessons about corruption is if you want to get away with it, make it boring. You know, <laughs> yeah. don't steal diamonds, steal influence. Yeah, it's, the, it's called, Jesse, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. It's like a mouthful. I'm asleep. What'd you say? Farah. <laughs> Farah. Uh, right. No, exactly. I'm not salivating, as you said, to have anybody go to jail. I think the probe is bogus from the beginning. And obviously Mueller's looking to nail somebody to the wall on a tiny deal. So you better make sure your taxes are in order. You better make sure your filings are in order. But I'm kind of with Kimberly. Like, 
do we do we want Hillary now thrown in jail? A part of me says no, like she's too old, she's grandmother now. I don't want to see Bill Clinton behind bars. It's getting where we're criminalizing politics. But if you want to play hardball and start knocking down Donald Trump's door and start, you know, putting him under oath and saying this 20 years ago, you did this deal. You know what? I say game on. Mm -hmm. Investigate the swamp. You have yeah. every appropriations thing under the microscope, well, every donor, every fundraiser, every lobbyist. You know, make sure the whole swamp is put under oath because right. the whole thing reeks. And it has a funny way of boomeranging on Democrats. Now, Samantha Power said now she unmasked hundreds of people. But wait a second. Many people were unmasked under her name, she says. She didn't do it. Perfect. Loretta Lynch mm -hmm. is now in the crosshairs. Comey may have illegally leaked. So Susan Rice's story hasn't been completely corroborated. So, you know, when, when all the dust settles, it's funny who's actually maybe Especially when you look at criminal. the PR firms and lobbying firms in D.C. who are more than willing to take money from the Russians. So think about that. Mm. All right, the Kate Steinle murder trial began today in San Francisco. The details straight ahead on The Five. Get the mama on the phone, take a trip back home Pretend they never knew they got some girls Drink a bottle of wine, got it a jury began hearing opening statements this morning in the case that set off a national debate on immigration, specifically on sanctuary cities. The Kate Steinle murder suspect went to trial today. Jose Zarate is an illegal immigrant who was deported five times before he allegedly killed 32-year-old Steinle in 2015. He was let back into the country by San Francisco, which grants safe haven to illegals. Shortly after Kate was gunned down, I flew across the country to confront the city's board of supervisors. The city of San Francisco let this guy out. Even though the feds said, hold him. I'm here to find out why you guys did that. Because this sanctuary city policy that you guys still support is costing lives. You know what Kate said, her last words? Look at the picture, guys. You guys aren't even looking. Look at the picture. You afraid? I know it's tough. Her last words were, help me. Help me. Why aren't you guys helping her? All right, so Kimberly, you're familiar yeah. with the politics of San Francisco. Intimately. You could see more Kate Stanley's, yet the board would not do anything about sanctuary city policy. There's such a, you know, with all due respect, but such a built-in, baked-in liberal bias. And, you know, I saw it firsthand, not only as First Lady, but as, you know, a prosecutor, an assistant district attorney in San Francisco, just in the courts, even trying to get a true identification of an individual. They would fight you tooth and nail. No one was complying with ICE detainers. Extremely frustrating to see a revolving door of people coming in and going back out again in county jail for two or three days and then being released back out, you know, just criminal recidivism abound. And so this was just such a senseless, you know, loss of life that could have been prevented just by administrations and officials and bureaucracies following the law, adhering to the law that's on the books. But it seems that public safety fell to second place at the expense of a really proactive policy on immigration as it relates to illegal criminal aliens. And Kimberly makes the point, Greg, that it was a preventable tragedy. And the media still does not want to touch the story. You have a beautiful young woman. You have Trump involved in the story, the city of San Francisco, political corruption. This guy was reported five times. He was a felon. You'd think this would be on the news constantly. Especially, too, when you think about, if you look at a, a different issue like gun control and the way the media has been spending a lot of time clamoring for more laws. We need more laws. There's suddenly law and order about gun control. In this case, is proof that, you know, you had existing laws that weren't enforced. And if you had enforced the law, she would have been alive. So how can you ignore that fact while clamoring for more laws for guns, arguably laws that wouldn't have stopped anything? But here is, here is law. Consistently, you should say, boy, they should enforce this law because this law is on the books. If you're going to feel strongly about gun control, how can you not feel strongly about this because it's still about law and order. The one interesting thing that I'm, I'm wondering is how this is going to pan out because I've been reading up on this about whether they find out that this was an accident mm -hmm. and if they and how is that going to play out if they find out because they talk about the bullet. The bullet has kind of a dent in it, which means that it was ricocheted. 
So what does that mean? I mean, does that mean that it would fit, that it's not? Guess what? It doesn't matter because the law will not provide an excuse for that to say I didn't intend mm -hmm. to kill you. It ricocheted. I was shooting it. I purposely discharged it, and they transfer intent. Mm. Right, because so, I think this was a five. weapon that was stolen Correct. from yeah. a, a law enforcement officer's car, and this. But guess what immigrant. the judge said? The judge says that is immaterial as to where the gun originally came from. It's just how the gun was used. What was its intended purchase? And purpose? the other part. And the other part the judge says is you can't consider immigration status. That's, that's not the issue here. The issue is whether or not he's charged with second degree murder, Jesse, Good right? And then the, he's, his lawyers are saying this was an accident. The gun was stolen from a U.S. Bureau of Land Management agent from his car. We don't know how uh, Zarate got the gun. But now the focus is on so was this involuntary manslaughter or an accident, in which case he should be acquitted? Uh, or maybe even is it a matter of mental illness or drug use, in which case you have a whole nother set of issues. But to me, you guys are complaining about so-called so liberal media. I think mainstream media, let's, say, let's put it that way, mainstream media not covering. And I think, boy, as I recall, it was conservative media attacking immigrants, especially illegal immigrants, who made this a cause celeb because they said, well, we're going to hold this up and we're going to attack those immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see it as that. We're not attacking immigrants, Juan. We're saying that the city of San attacking Francisco criminals. should never yes. have allowed him criminals. in the city because he had five felonies. I think should the federal deported, government sent they, him there. Excuse me? The federal government had arrested him. He had served some time. They then sent him Involving to, to he was San Francisco. He five times, right. and they he kept getting him. arrested in San Francisco, and they never told ICE about him. They sent him back to San Francisco on a marijuana charge, as I understand. Well, now it's no, he had numerous sanctuary. charges, yeah. one of which was marijuana. Yeah. He also had harder narcotics problems. Well, I would, the only thing I would add, so there's, um, there, there's six men and six women in the jury, and it's interesting to me that they, this is how juries usually end up. It's just a range of people from a flight attendant, software engineer, a nurse, a marketing accountant, and a health economist. So these people, it's a jury of his peers. They will decide his fate, guilty or innocent, and then the, I guess the judge probably decides the sentencing, Kimberly. Yeah. Um, that's not his that, that is not his peers. That's well, the funny thing about, th is that a jury well, of his how, peers? That, I mean, that's how our, our system is. It's, they say the trial will expect, uh, last four to his six peers weeks. peers would be illegal aliens. Should've they would be, right. <laughs> that's Change right. Of you can find plenty of those in San Francisco. Oh, wait, that's going to be their next point. Yeah, exactly. They're going like, yeah. to file a lawsuit that that's not their peers. Yeah, that's true. I wouldn't they be will. surprised. They'll appeal it on that and lack of uh, change of venue that it was improper. He wasn't able to get a fair trial due to the media Jeez. coverage there. All right. Wait for it. On a lighter note, it is the biggest concert of the year. The Super Bowl 52 halftime show headliner has been selected. The reveal and our thoughts up next. Cool song. So the rumors are true. Justin Timberlake confirming he will headline this year's halftime at Super Bowl 52 in a very creative announcement alongside his pal, Jimmy Fallon. Interesting. Excuse me, sir, do you have the time? I was going to ask you, sir, if you have the time. I do have the time. You do have time? I do have time. You do have time? I do have time. You do have time? I do have time. You're doing the halftime show at the Super Bowl? You do have time! <laughs> <laughs> yep, Justin swears this time, though, there won't be a, mal a wardrobe malfunction. You may remember his first halftime duo with Janet Jackson caused quite a storm a decade ago. So I think this would be his third time he was there with NSYNC and Janet Jackson. So three times. Uh, I can't think of anything I'm less interested in than who was at the at halftime. It's, it, 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 I don't care. I don't care about Justin Timberlake. I don't care about Super Bowl halftime. I believe that's when it all started to fall apart was when they took a sport and they turned it into a spectacle. They felt that they they felt compelled to take something that people went to watch for entertainment mm -hmm. and they turned it into something celebrity driven. And I would just sit there and I go, this is this is so not fun and it used to be fun now now and then so it's no surprise that it turned into politics what if there's because, kneeling i know that's what they are they gonna the go, song if, or i'm sure that if he doesn't go out and kneel he's gonna get a lot of crap for it you're supposed to be watching football for the sport it's not to enlighten you it's not occupy wall street it's nfl <laughs> i'm done with it done dana, dana so one of the things that people are talking about is in fact that janet jackson 
has never been invited back. And, the, and the, the rumor is that she is banned from Super Bowl halftimes, although the league says that's not true. But she was disinvited from a Grammy appearance and the like. And then people say, well, how come she gets all this blame, but not the, the guy? Well, isn't it typical? Yeah, I think it's unfair, <laughs> but not surprising. But I will say that I think that Broncos fans are really going to enjoy when you know they're cheering on their team at the Super Bowl and they watch Justin Timberlake. It's going to be great. Oh, <laughs> in, in Minneapolis because you're a Broncos fan. Do you realize how bad the Broncos are this year? <laughs> No, I, they're Have you really, seen any they're, of the they're, games? They're coming back, and Juan's got the colors on today to prove it. There you oh, go. Oh, he does. Oh, wait, oh you never He'll know. Channeling a little Elway. A little Elway, a little Dana Perino right here. So <laughs> you're a real fan. You love this sport. But here comes now Greg saying, you know, it's become too political. I remember, wasn't it Beyonce with the, the fist and the black leather? Black leather. <laughs> like this? Yeah, yeah, black leather jacket and all that. <laughs> and seem to be delivering a message there. What do you think? Only non-football fans care about the halftime show. That's when all the people get up and they get excited. They're at their party. The people that actually don't watch football, they are there for the commercials and for the halftime show. I could, I could care less about the halftime show. You I'm like with Greg with it. I'm going to be watching my Eagles um, at the Super Bowl, so I'm probably going to be taking a bathroom break. <laughs> probably be restocking on my snacks. Wings. And wings. Probably getting beaten up. Sliders. Probably no, no. Excuse so, me, excuse me. You want reality? Me. Reality is your children. I oh, think wait, you you're a Redskins fan, right? I, I'm a Washington football team fan. <laughs> oh, you don't even say the name of your own team, Mark. Right? Where have you been? Me. We yeah. have a game tonight. You want to play us a little wager? No, because it's I, at think, home I think too, that, baby. Let's I think, go. I think your Eagles should win. Let me just say <laughs> that. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah. All right, Kimberly, yeah, yeah. a moment ago you again. said yeah. <laughs> that Janet Jackson, you think, came out on the bad end of this deal. And even yes. Timberlake says she got 90% of the blame. Right. He only got 10%. Um, listen, we can do a dramatic reenactment here. Um, and I'll show you that <laughs> no, he's I equally as I think we'll avoid this. He was the intervening. <laughs> No, but it's true. Right. You know, the two of them did the performance together. They both knew, but yet he's back again. Very unfair. Sad exclamation point. <laughs> Go. Yeah. All right. One more thing. Up next. It's time for one more thing. Let's do this. All right. Greg's Shoppers News. You know, there's nothing better than shopping for pigs and pugs. As you'll see here, a woman was shopping in Florida. Uh, she was stocking wow. up on her pork. And she also oh, had, uh, wow. over here, she found a pug in aisle <laughs> nine, which is pugs. Aisle eight is pigs. Aisle nine is pugs. How did she have room to buy anything? The whole thing's full. I don't know. And then she realized she forgot her purse and just left them there. Maybe they <laughs> ate it. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> that was cute. It was. Juan. Oh, okay. I was, I was fascinated. I had so many questions about that. Anyway, I wanted to give a shout out to BNC Magazine. That's the broadcasting and cable news people. Last week, they had their 15th annual Hispanic Television Summit here in New York and invited me on a panel to discuss modern media and young Hispanics. I was joined by fellow journalists from BuzzFeed, ABC News, and CNN. Everybody's ratings are up these days from broadcast to cable to social media. But the biggest jump Hispanic news consumption. So it was fascinating to hear about the strides Hispanic media is making and the in industry's interest in them. Didn't I do right. this with you yes, last Yes, you year? did. Uh, they didn't ask me Let's back. Let's roll this along. <laughs> All right, so Jesse's going to love this one. So French President Emmanuel Macron, he had a do his dog made quite a splash oh. at the Elysee Palace. So they're at a meeting. They have a dog named Nemo, and they're all talking. The dog actually took a lead. Oh. 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 Yeah. Fireplace. That's what we call wee wee. On tape. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That was great. All right, Nicely ended there. Nice he's a, he's a rescue. They, they rescued him in August, and so they were still working on the palace training. Is rescue what used to be a pound dog? Yes. Okay. Something like that. Uh, Kimberly. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, this is You're super, welcome. super, super cute. So nine-year-old sends pre the president uh, $3 and gets a letter back in return. Elijah was very concerned, Davies, uh, from Tennessee, because he heard from his parents that President Trump was only going to take a salary of $1. Uh, uh, so he's like, how is this going to be? Take a listen. How is he going to eat or drink or, you know, pay if he needs to pay for um, his bill, water bill or anything? Oh my God, the cutest thing ever. So back in January, Elijah sent him the three bucks. He got the letter back. He was very excited, including the three dollars. Oh my Aww. God. Gave it back to, him, to make a difference in his community and to think big and dream even bigger. So he reinvested. My friend runs a correspondence office. Oh, wow. She does a good job.
Wow, name that's a good job. Well, I didn't name her. I didn't drop her name. Well, oh, you're really important. Drop it like it's. I have people. I know people that do important stuff too. Jesse. Like what? Jesse's <laughs> important. We'll see. <laughs> um, so. All of the five former presidents living were raising money for the hurricane relief over the weekend. And there they were. They raised, I think, over $33 million, which is right. quite incredible. But there was a funny moment during President Clinton's speech between W and Obama. Roll it. It can be a new beginning if we just do what we ought to do. I mean, something's not right. <laughs> so there goes W cracking a joke. Obama's <laughs> laughing, and he's looking at to see if Obama's up. There he is, peeking. Did he find it funny? Yes, he did. There There's something go. on. And then that Obama's Bill's trying back. not That's to laugh. <laughs> well, There's something on. Kick, kick me, son. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I was yes. Or we'll just leave it at that. Set your DVRs. Never miss an episode of the Five. Special report is up next. Rawr.